Education, and the Ed Council. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and I have four movies I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show. Down from my usual five, but not many movies have actually opened at the box office this weekend. I was actually personally very disappointed to see that an inconvenient sequel, despite what I said on last week's show in my segment, What's Coming Out Next, was not actually coming out in theaters nationwide this past weekend it will be this coming weekend i don't know why it took so long for the movie to come out so soon i mean new york and la of course movies open there early all the time i get that why not boston i don't know but in any event i'm gonna get to my four movies that are i that I'm going to review. But first, let's get into my segment, What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. Not all of them are necessarily box office winners, but the ones that are, I will definitely tell you about. <clears throat> so number one of the box office this weekend was fortunately a really great movie that was number one last week, Dunkirk, the Christopher Nolan World War II epic that will probably be ranking on the same level as other World War II movies post-World War II, such as Saving Private Ryan and The Thin Red Line, amongst others. But Dunkirk grossed $26.6 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $100 million, Dunkirk has just grossed in the United States $101.3 million, and around the world, including in the United States, it has grossed $232.8 million. So, Dunkirk is so far a tentative hit here in the United States. Around the world, it is most certainly a certified hit. The Emoji Movie is the highest grossing debut movie of the week, and I'm going to try and hold my tongue and not tell you what I thought about the movie until I actually get to the movie reviews later in the show. So, really holding my tongue in this one. But the Emoji Movie grossed $24.5 million in its opening weekend, and that's against a budget of $50 million. So, it's not a hit yet, but chances are, given its numbers... It might be a hit by next week. I don't have the international numbers for you for this movie, so I really can't say whether it's a tentative certified hit around the world. I just don't know. Girls Trip is off to a really good start. It was number two at the box office last week in its debut. This week it fell to number three, earning $19.6 million. And a lot of buzz in this movie has been really good. A lot of you might remember my review of it two weeks ago. I gave it my rating of a checkout. And this weekend, Girls Trip made, well, I I already said that, but against a budget of $27.7 million, Girls Trip has made so far in the United States $65.1 million, which makes it already a certified hit here in the States. I don't know how much money it's made overseas yet, but vicariously, if it's a certified hit here in the States, it's a certified hit around the world as well. Atomic Blonde was a movie that I expected to open at a higher number than it ultimately did. This weekend, it debuted at number four. It's the number two highest grossing debut movie of the week, but number four overall. It grossed $18.3 million at the U.S. box office against a budget of $30 million. So it's not a hit yet, but it's off to a pretty good start, especially given its modest budget. And around the world, it has made $24.5 million so far. Again, I'm going to try to hold my tongue and not say how I felt about the movie. I usually say how I feel about the movie after I've seen it and after I've reviewed it for all of you on the air right here. So, Atomic Blonde, the review is coming up right after this segment and right after the next break, so stay tuned for that. Spider-Man Homecoming, in its fourth week in release, is number five at the box office this weekend, sliding from number three last week. This week, Spider-Man Homecoming made a decent $13.3 million, but against a budget of $175 million, Spider-Man Homecoming has so far grossed $278.2 million here in the States and $633.6 million worldwide. So it's doing incredibly well for itself. Here in the States, it's a tentative hit. It has to gross $350 million or more for me to 
counted as a certified hit, but around the world it is already certified, so good for Spider-Man Homecoming. A movie that I'm very surprised is as low as it is in its third week in release is War for the Planet of the Apes, which debuted at number one, last week it was number four, and this week it's number six. So it's not a huge slide, not as much as the last time, but I'm still very surprised because I expected this movie to be doing better by this time. But this weekend it grossed $10.5 million against a budget of $150 million, that's one five zero. War for the Planet of the Apes has so far grossed $118.8 million here in the States and $224.7 million around the world. So it is a tentative hit. It was, it's not a hit yet here in the States. Around the world is a tentative hit, and that's too bad because War for the Planet of the Apes is really one of my favorite movies of the summer so far. And I think it deserves to be doing a lot better than it ultimately is. I don't know why it's struggling as much as it seems to be struggling. Despicable Me 3, I know why this movie's doing well. I just kind of thought that people would be whole, be sick of the whole Minions thing by now, but apparently not. In this fifth week in release, it's number seven at the box office, having grossed $7.6 million. Against a budget of $80 million, Despicable Me has so far grossed $230.3 million here in the States and $822.7 million worldwide, which means, a little bit of a spoiler, it has surpassed Wonder Woman in international gross, but not domestic gross. But it's a certified hit here in the States and around the world. A movie that's really, really struggling and looks like it's going to be a bomb is Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets, which only grossed $6.4 million in its second week in release. Against a budget of $177 to $210 million, Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets has so far grossed $30.2 million here in the States and $51.7 million worldwide. So it looks like it's going to be a flop. Baby Driver is number nine at the box office this weekend, having grossed $4 million here in the States just this weekend. Against a budget of $34 million, Baby Driver has so far made $92 million here in the States and $138.6 million around the world, making it a certified hit. And Wonder Woman, as I've said, is already a certified hit. This weekend, in its ninth week in release, it's number 10 at the box office, having grossed $3.3 million. Again, and I would have the other numbers for you, but I'm out of time. The first movie I'm going to be, be, be reviewing for you, again, I'm tripping up on my words, excuse me for that, is Atomic Blonde, which is a movie I expected to open at number two, if not number three. It opened up at number four this weekend, but by no means does that reflect the quality of the movie, which I have to say is really good. So it's directed by David Leitch, and it is based on the Anthony Johnston and Sam Hart penned 2012 graphic novel The Coldest City and it stars Charlize Theron and James McAvoy. Charlize Theron plays an MI6 that is a British intelligence agent whose name is Lorraine Broughton although you don't really have to know her by that name. Atomic Blonde is just fine. That's probably her code name although I, I don't think the words Atomic Blonde ever appeared in this movie at all but if you are nitpicky about that even if you are, you will probably be greatly entertained by this movie. It is a movie that is a spy thriller that takes place in 1989 in eastern and western Germany. See, at that point, the Berlin Wall was up. And even though communism in western Europe was kind of on its last leg... It doesn't really matter in this movie because this takes place in November of 1989, which, which showed that even though communism was crumbling, there was still a lot of espionage between the free world and the communist world, or as they were known at that time, the first and second world. So Charlize Theron, as I said, is an undercover MI6 agent who is sent to Berlin during the Cold War to investigate the murder of a fellow agent and recover a missing list of double agents. So you hear about this list all the time, and it's not exactly a list that's on paper. It's instead, it's a piece of microfilm that is concealed in a wristwatch that contains the name of every active field agent in the Soviet Union. So after the death of this other MI6 agent, 
who is killed in the very beginning of the movie, and that's not a spoiler alert. Lorraine goes to Berlin to recover the list and assassinate Satchel, a double agent whose identity is unknown to her, who has sold lots of intelligence to the Soviets for years, and who betrayed the fallen MI6 agent whose death Lorraine Broughton, or Bruton maybe, B-R-O-U-G-H-T-O-N, I'm going to say Broughton, is investigating. So, she teams up with actually another agent by the name of Percival, who's played here by James McAvoy in a very colorful performance. And it's beginning to show that James McAvoy, first of all, this is his year, uh, despite the fact that he's not in an X-Men movie that, that's coming out anytime soon. He wasn't one last year, but not this year. But with this movie, Atomic Blonde, and the M. Night Shyamalan movie he did earlier this year, Split, which did incredibly well for a January movie, and it's no wonder because it was really good, James McAvoy is becoming less and less underrated. And it, it's, it's all for the, the best, really. So... His performance here as David Percival is not only a really funny performance and also a colorful performance in a movie that really doesn't have a lot of color in it. It's not completely black and white, but it has a lot of shades of black, white, and gray in it, along with some color, including the blonde color of Charlize Theron's hair. But not only does... James McAvoy have some really good lines. There are also some great scenes, including one when you first get to know the character of how James McAvoy's character, Percival, moves effortlessly from one side of the Berlin Wall to the other. And if you know your history about the Berlin Wall, you probably know that a lot of people who are probably not in the government or possessed any any especially great amount of intelligence tried some very desperate measures to go from one side of the Berlin Wall to the other. In fact, I think there was one person in history who actually built a slingshot, a, a human-sized slingshot, and literally catapulted himself from one side of the wall to the other. He made it, but he broke both of his arms and both of his legs. Well, the intelligence officers in this movie know how to get from one side of the Berlin Wall to the other. And it's actually quite entertaining to see exactly how they do it, especially when James McAvoy's character Percival does it. But in addition to James McAvoy teaming up really well with Charlize Theron and having great chemistry there, Charlize Theron is amazing in this movie. Not only does she act well, but she also makes a great action heroine. And I think one of the things that a lot of action movies get wrong, especially with female leads, is that whenever the heroine of an action movie gets into a fight, she comes out without a scratch. Here, Charlize Theron gets banged around a lot. And when we first meet her, she's actually bathing in ice. I guess apparently not shivering, but she also has a black eye and several other bumps and bruises, to put it lightly, on her body. And I think that, I mean, not only is it realistic, but it also makes her character more welcoming and more intriguing. But the plot of this movie is certainly very complex, as you might expect from a spy movie. You don't know when you're watching exactly who sh you should be rooting for or who sh you should be suspicious of, including Charlize Theron's character, Lorraine Broughton. But I enjoyed this movie immensely. I thought it had a great 80s soundtrack. I don't think there's a single original song in here, but the songs they chose for this movie were fit the mood of the movie perfectly. I also, again, liked how the colors emulated Sin City in the sense that it's based on a comic book and may, had that sort of comic book feel to it. But I thought the... The colors, especially the neon colors, worked well with the movie. I'm, I'm astonished more people didn't see this movie, but as for me, I'm giving it my rating of a knockout. Charlize Theron shows she's not going anywhere anytime soon, and I hope a lot of people see this film. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Emoji Movie. And when I was going over this movie in last week's segment, What's Coming Out Next, I was the very first to tell you I wasn't thrilled about this movie. So going into it, I wasn't thrilled with it. And 
Now that I've seen it, I'm still not thrilled with it. As a matter of fact, I think this was a movie that tried. It had decent animation. I think the animation was a little bit more archaic than what we've seen from such animation giants as Disney Pixar and DreamWorks, amongst others. It actually was produced by Sony Pictures Animation and distributed by Columbia Pictures. And unfortunately, this is a movie that very much like the emoji craze, I don't think people will be talking about this movie five years from now. In fact, I don't think people will be talking about this movie five weeks from now or even five days. It made its money at the box office. Again, just a reminder, it's not a hit yet. It earned $24 million off of a $50 million budget. It probably will recoup all its money back, but... Overall, it was just unfunny, and I felt like I had wasted my money, not to mention my time, watching this film. It is a movie that borrows greatly in terms of plot and in terms of theme from much better animated movies of recent years, such as The Lego Movie and Wreck-It Ralph. In fact, I thought I was thinking of dubbing this movie Wrecked Ralph. Because that's what it feels like. I was also toying with the idea of just reviewing this movie with emojis. <laughs> but then I just realized having hearing me just say poop emoji over and over again is not particularly compelling radio. But it's a movie that's not terrible, but it really isn't very funny. And the plot is so predictable. So the plot, in case you're interested, is about an emoji whose name is Gene, who is basically a smiley face. He is that round yellow dot, basically, that smiley faces are supposed to be, except he's not exactly a smiley face because he's not supposed to smile. He's supposed to be a meh emoji. He's somebody who's basically supposed to reflect a feeling of indifference. The only thing is that Gene can't exactly do that in his community of Textopolis. The community members of Textopolis are all emojis, all of whom have one expression. So somebody who's supposed to be a sad emoji is supposed to be crying all the time. And I think you pretty much get the idea. So Gene is an outcast and a misfit because of the fact that he cannot hold one expression. So in a very contrived plot point about which I absolutely didn't care, Gene is recruited to be the official meh emoji of the community inside the phone of his user, who's a human being named Alex. And Alex is a 14-year-old high school freshman who wants to send a meh emoji to a girl he likes because nothing sweeps women off their feet like a smiley face that just looks indifferent. Well, anyway, he causes chaos in his Textopolis community when he can't keep a meh face. And he comes as a disappointment to his meh emoji parents who are played, I think, in probably the best casting choice by Stephen Wright, who's his father, and his mother, uh, Jennifer Coolidge. But Stephen Wright, that was a good casting choice. That's probably the only compliment I'll give this movie. So Gene goes on an, an expedition, a quest, with another emoji who has since gone out of style. In this case, it's a, it's a hand that's completely flattened out, which is supposed to be a high five emoji, who's voiced by James Corden. And I didn't mention the voice of Gene. He is TJ Miller, who is from uh, such movies or well, he was in a really good movie last year called Office Christmas Party, and he's also done voices for, or he's been in Yogi Bear and done voices in two of the How to Train Your Dragon movies so far. He's a regular on the HBO hit sitcom Silicon Valley. So his voice is very distinctive and familiar, but that's all the movie really has going for it. So anyway, Gene goes on a quest with another emoji, a uh, high five to find a hacker to firmly set Gene's expression permanently to meh. Are you interested? Because I'm really not at this point. I'm interested in talking about the movie and explaining the plot, but it is so dull. And this part mercilessly rips off Wreck-It Ralph. But the cool thing about Wreck-It Ralph is the 
video game universe of Wreck-It Ralph made sense. And it also made sense for Wreck-It Ralph, who's a, who's a retro game character, to break out of his game and try to find himself by going somewhere else. There was just a lot more originality to that movie. I thought there was a lot more use of the different characters, all of whom came from different video games of years past. In fact, I would probably say that the one scene where there was a, from Rocket Ralph, where there was a villain from Street Fighter 2 who said to Rocket Ralph, you're a bad guy, but you're not a bad guy. That one line right there was more clever than anything in the Emoji movie, and probably far less predictable as well. And also in terms of movie plots, this film had the contrived, you may be a misfit, but... You don't have to go you don't have to go through drastic measures to be somebody else. You can just be yourself and everything will be okay. The problem is the setup to this movie is that apparently the danger of an emoticon reflecting a, another emotion that it's not supposed to is that the phone user will get frustrated and erase all the content on his phone which isn't really compelling because I change my phone every two years. Who cares? They're going to die in two years anyway. So the emoji movie is totally not worth your time. It is really unfortunate that the made, it made the amount of money it did, and it gets my rating of a flunk out. It's not a terribly offensive movie, but it's so unoriginal, it's so not worth recommending. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Nobody Speak, Trials of the Free Press, which is a Netflix documentary that just debuted, well, about a month ago, but... It's a movie that I've actually been wanting to review for a while. I just didn't get around to seeing it until this weekend, which was a pretty slow weekend at the movies as it was. And this is a movie that I actually kind of wish that Netflix didn't release, although I'm glad it did. The reason I wish that Netflix didn't release it and it went to movie theaters is because I can better pay attention to movies when they're playing in theaters. I'm not distracted as much, provided I turn off my phone, which I almost always do. But watching it on Netflix, and maybe this is a my grievance with watching a movie anywhere else other than a movie theater, but watching it on Netflix, you can pause it and watch it later at any time, and I think that disrupts the narrative flow of a movie inevitably. At the same time, I do like the fact that over the last 15 years, more and more people have been watching documentaries. In fact, throughout the 80s and 90s, docu- no, not many people made documentaries because not a lot of people went out to see them. There were exceptions, of course, but I think in large part, Michael Moore revamped the popularity of the documentary, whether he wanted to or not. And that definitely shows from the selection that you see on Netflix. So what I like about Trials of the, uh, Nobody Speak Trials of the Free Press is that I can recommend it to you. You can get on your phone or your, your tablet and watch it instantly. But again, I'm not going to complain too much. You can watch it, not pay too much more for the movie. But let me tell you what Trials, uh, Nobody Speak Trials of the Free Press is about. Well, it centers on two particular lawsuits focusing on, or rather, Not two lawsuits. There's one lawsuit, and there was also a controversial purchase of a prominent newspaper. So the lawsuit was actually a libel lawsuit against, um, brought about by Hulk Hogan against Gawker Media. So let me tell you a little bit about that lawsuit. Hulk Hogan, whose real name is Terry Bolia, it was part of a sex tape involving it was after he divorced his wife but he was engaged in sexual intercourse on this sex tape with a woman named heather cole who is the then wife of his best friend tampa bay radio shock jock bubba the love sponge whose real name is todd allen clem so the curious thing about this sex tape is one it was made and whenever a celebrity makes a sex tape they really have to expect that other people are eventually going to see it. 
But apparently not a lot of celebrities have learned their lesson. But the even stranger thing is that Bubba the Love Sponge not only taped the sex tape, showing his then-wife, to whom he was married at the time, having sex with Hulk Hogan, but also he wasn't taping it in secret. Th- this was a totally consensual thing between Bubba the Love Sponge and his wife, and Hulk Hogan. So Hulk Hogan was in on this, and Gawker, which is a... <laughs> well, it, it's, it's now defunct, but it was a digital news site founded by Nick Denton, and he started the website as sort of a tabloid news site. It it wasn't meant to reflect serious news, although it did sometimes. It broke some relatively controversial stories that had some impact, for better or for worse, on the 2016 election, and probably for worse. But anyway, this was the website that brought Gawker Media down. Now, whether or not Hulk Hogan had the right to sue these people is kind of irrelevant. He definitely had the right to sue them, but did he have good reason to sue them? That's really up to the viewer to decide. But in any case, Hulk Hogan, I'm not going to call him Terry Bolia because I don't know him by that name at all, but Hulk Hogan sued Gawker Media, won, uh, actually uh, a seven-figure, wait, hold on, a nine-figure lawsuit, a $115 million he won, and Gawker is, as a result, now defunct. And Hulk Hogan won this lawsuit in March of last year, 2016. Now, the twist is that it wasn't just Hulk Hogan who brought about this lawsuit. There was actually a, multi, a billionaire by the name of Peter Thale who financed Hulk Hogan's lawsuit and his attorney fees against Gawker Media. It was a risky move, but the the documentary asks a very good question. Why was this guy up, up, up against or involved in a lawsuit that had no bearing on this person's reputation or basically who didn't have anything to do with him whatsoever? Well, the movie speculates that this billionaire, Peter Thale, wanted to get back at Gawker Media after they published a story about them, which was also grounds for, for libel, that Peter Thiel is gay. Turns out that story is actually true, but Peter Thiel was none too happy about it. Or His last name is spelled T-H-I-E-L. I'm not sure if that's Thiel or Thale. But the more the documentary goes on, the more you realize that there is a pervasive trend of multimillionaires and billionaires involving or putting their money into basically sabotaging the news. And one of the last stories, which I think actually should have been the focus of the movie, was how casino owner Sheldon Adelson purchased the Las Vegas Review Journal and the fallout of that. I wish I could get into details about how wrong that is for multimillionaires and billionaires to actually buy legitimate newspapers. And of course, this is not something new, but it's something that's been more relevant ever since the election of Donald Trump. And you could argue that the Hulk Hogan case is just a gossip case, but the, the documentary argues effectively that it's so much more than that. And for that reason, I give Nobody Speak, Trials of the Free Press, my rating of a knockout. It's a documentary that's a must-see. Mm-hmm. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is another Netflix original, which is called You Get Me. This is another film that very much like the movie I just reviewed, Nobody Speak, Trials of the Free Press, is a film that A, debuted on Netflix, and B, I didn't get around to watching until a month from now, or a month from when it was first released. But I'm getting to this one a little bit late, and it's a movie I didn't have high expectations for, and those low expectations were probably met with... They they, they certainly didn't... Ex- what the film was did not exceed my expectations at all. So You Get Me is a thriller film about high school students, and I almost made thriller sound like filler, but that's kind of what this movie feels like. It's directed by Brent Bonacurso. 
Excuse me, let me say that again. It's directed by Brent Bonacorso and was written by Ben Epstein. The movie stars Bella Thorne and Taylor John Smith, who are the principal actors in this movie. And Taylor John Smith plays Tyler, who is a 17-year-old high school student who is in love with his girlfriend, Allie, who's played by Halston Sage. And they are, at first, inseparable, but then one night at a sort of back to school party, which is sort of the end of summer party. He finds out from an old boyfriend of Allie's that she was a little bit more promiscuous, allegedly, than Tyler anticipated. So heartbroken, belligerent, and reacting a little bit more strongly against Allie at this party, he eventually hooks up with a mysterious girl who doesn't go to his school, whose name is Holly, who's played by the beautiful... Bella Thorne. So they end up partying and sleeping together. And then eventually Tyler makes amends with his girlfriend, Allie. And I'm not sure if his reaction at that party to Allie's alleged promiscuity was in an overstatement. I, but my guess is that it probably would be if I was hit with that kind of news, I would generally ignore it, especially considering that it's coming second hand from a guy who could tell me that for a plethora of reasons. He's jealous. He wants the girl back. It doesn't matter. Either way, that's kind of the contrived way this this plot starts. So things get murky when Tyler begins school and lo and behold, a new student comes in by the name of Holly, who lo and behold is that same girl with whom he had that one night stand about which his girlfriend, Allie does not know happened. So this movie has been done so many times before. And I, I don't know exactly why this movie didn't work besides the fact that the plot's been done so many times before, because it seems like any movie like that, where there's a one night stand and the person at the receiving end of the one-night stand becomes obsessed with the person with whom he or she is hooked up. That's happened. That has happened in so many movies. It hasn't gotten more original than Fatal Attraction. And, and unfortunately, I do think Netflix made a mistake picking up this film, specifically because... Netflix has raised the bar with documentaries, like I mentioned, like Nobody Speak, and other original films. And when I say original, I mean really original. Ones I haven't even seen, ones where I haven't even seen movies like that in theaters. And of course, the the TV shows it's had, House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, Glow, these are movie these are shows that I haven't reviewed on this show because this is a show about movies, not about TV shows. But those had really compelling content and really compelling, not to mention original characters that I had not seen anywhere else before I caught them on Netflix. I mean, Netflix is in the middle of a revolution right now. And You Get Me is one of those films that is so predictable from the onset. In addition to that, and I don't know if this is Bella Thorne's fault, Bella Thorne is not scary. She's pretty. There's no doubt about that. I began to think to myself, is it is she not scary because she doesn't have very much to work with with the script? Or is she not scary because she's really hot? I don't know. It might seem sexist for me to presume the latter. Maybe it's both reasons. But either way, considering there are some guys who would who would kill to have a woman who looked like Bella Thorne obsessed with them. And of course, it's one of those things, be careful what you wish for, because somebody who is obsessed with you, I mean, regardless of what they look like, is still a creepy idea and it's I I just wish the movie had elaborated upon that aspect of it how the the movie should have acknowledged how hot the woman was and maybe explored upon the irony of a hot person being obsessed with somebody else and then realizing the 
ramifications of that. I think if they had gone that angle, it would have been a more original movie. Instead, You Get Me is very formulaic, very predictable. And I think the actors in this movie, Bella Thorne included, do what they can with what they're given. But the, the, the problem is there's not a lot that they're given. I eventually thought that <laughs> Bella Thorne's character would eventually go on a roller coaster ride with somebody close to uh, the, the character T- Taylor John Smith plays because this movie follows Fatal att- Attraction so closely. Somebody once said that there were only seven plots that, that movies have these days. I would probably go as far as saying maybe 14 or 15. And one of those plots is certainly other. But even if it was other, I, I, th- I think that this movie just doesn't give you a lot. And I'm disappointed in Netflix for picking it up. But then again, we don't have as many movie rental places as we used to. And of course, we also don't have you know, direct, direct to video or direct to DVD is not a term anymore because that's just a waste of space. The movie industry's moved on, but you get me gets my rating of a very low strikeout. I wouldn't call it a flunk out. Welcome back to words on film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I am completely out of movies to review. There are only two really big movies to have come out in theaters this past weekend, the Emoji Movie and Atomic Blonde, one of which was really good and the other one of which was the Emoji Movie. And I didn't have enough time this week to scope out the movies that are available to me on Netflix. I just didn't get around to doing it. But because I only reviewed four movies, I'm going to get into a little bit of movie news, partly because it's fascinating and the other part is I've just completely run out of things to talk about. So the Toronto Film Festival is coming up in about a month and the the movies that are lining up or on the lineup for the for TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival, sound pretty good. And again, this is almost like my segment that I'm going to do for my next segment on the show, which is what's coming out next. But this is not this is a list of movies that are not coming out next week, probably not even next month, probably a couple of months from now. But based on their descriptions, I'm fascinated to see what they, what they offer. So... One of the biggest movies to come out is one that's directed by and probably written by and starring James Franco, which is called The Disaster Artist. And this is based on a book of the same name by Greg Sestero. Greg Sestero is an actor who's still relatively well known, except in cult circles. But he starred in a movie which was written, produced, and directed and starring a strange man from Poland by the name of Tommy Wiseau. So the movie did not make much of an impact upon its release because it was an independent film and didn't really get very much distribution. But ultimately, thanks to the internet and some very savvy critics, the movie is now a cult classic based solely on how bad it was. The irony is that this movie got this so bad it's good quality that caused a lot of A-listers, including James Franco and his brother Dave Franco, not to mention Seth Rogen, Alison Brie, and others, to be a part of this movie, The Disaster Artist, which is about the making of this uniquely terrible movie. So I was actually, this past weekend, at a midnight showing of The Room at my favorite movie theater, Coolidge Corner Theater in Brookline, Massachusetts. And they showed a preview or a a teaser trailer of The Disaster Artist. And usually when it comes to previews, I stand outside the, the theater and wait for the previews to be over and come in only when the movie starts. But this one I really had to see. And I gotta tell you, Based on the teaser trailer, which I I probably prefer over regular two-minute trailers that basically give away the whole movie, I am really looking forward to seeing The Disaster Artist. So it's not going to come out next week. It's going to premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival later this month. I really, really wish I could go, but I can't. 
But when I see this movie, and it is when, not if, I will let you know about it on this show. But there are some other movies that are coming out at the Toronto International Film Festival. One of them is actually a sequel to one of my favorite documentaries of all time, Supersize Me. This sequel documentary, I guess you could call it a sequel, is directed by Morgan Spurlock, and the title of it is Supersize Me 2, Holy Chicken. Now, part of me is a little bit worried because Supersize Me was taking on not the whole fast food industry, but just McDonald's. And that movie had such an influence on me, I kid you not, that when I saw Supersize Me in June 2004, I said, I am never eating another burger at McDonald's again. Ever. Well, 13 years later, I have still never eaten a burger at McDonald's since seeing that movie. I've eaten a couple of other things. Like, occasionally I'll go to McDonald's and have an ice cream cone, but this beats my attitude before seeing Super Size Me, which was, how can I live without McDonald's food? My attitude after Super Size Me was, how did I ever eat that stuff? So I'm a li- the reason I'm a little worried about the title, Holy Chicken, is... I'm afraid this movie is going to go after, well, it's probably definitely going to go after KFC, but it might also go after Popeyes, which I like a lot better than KFC. I like them both, but I really love fried chicken. It's a great summer food. But again, I only know about it from its title and the fact that Morgan Spurlock is directing it, but I'd be interested to see how this movie is. But anyway, some other movies that are coming out at the Toronto International Film Festival. I only have about two minutes, but I'll get into them just based on the brief descriptions I've given from the rap.com. There is a rap battle satire that's produced by Eminem. I, and it's a satire, so it's a fictional movie, and it's called Bodied, and it's directed by Joseph Kahn. And I'm, I can't exactly tell you how many other um what other movies Joseph Kahn has directed because I can't really look that up right now. But there's also another movie directed by Soichi Yumizawa, which is called Vampire Clay. And again, I only know these movies from the director and from the title, so I can't exactly assume what Vampire Clay is. But the Japanese horror movies I've seen, what few I've seen, have been pretty terrifying. So I think... I don't think Vampire Clay will be anything like the Twilight series, but of course I am basing that on the fact that a Japanese person is directing it. So there there are some other movies that are coming out. Let's see. There's one called Ex Libris, the New York Public Library, and I would be very interested to see what that is because the fact that they made a documentary about the new uh, about a public library, let alone the New York Public Library, either means one of two things: either the library is close to being shut down, or it's doing really well despite the fact that people have smartphones now and can look up almost anything. So I'm very interested to see that. I'm also interested to see the documentary directed by Brett Morgan, which is called Jane, which is about primatologist Jane Goodall, who is the subject of the Sigourney Weaver movie Gorillas in the Midst, which I hadn't seen. But to see a documentary about Jane Goodall, I'm very interested in seeing that as well. And... Next up is going to be what's coming out next, as in next weekend. And it's now time for my final segment, which is what's coming out next. This is a spoken word preview of the movies that are coming out this coming weekend. I can't say whether these movies are going to be good or bad, but I will definitely let you know how I think they're going to be, and you will listen. (laughs) I'm just kidding. But anyway, coming out August 4th are going to be fortunately more movies than this weekend. One of the things is that the documentary, which I was looking forward to seeing last weekend, and I'm looking forward to seeing now, the only difference is I thought it was coming out last weekend, but it didn't, was an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power, where Al Gore reveals how the world has changed, or maybe how it stayed the same, since he came out with his documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, Back in 2006, this is a movie that not only earned many deserved accolades, but 
it also changed the world. And I said last week, you know that it's a good documentary when Fox News gives an Al Gore documentary a positive review. (laughs) That's incredible. And yeah, Dinesh D'Souza should probably wish that one of his documentaries would be as influential. But that is a movie that certainly changed the world. And I am intrigued, maybe not excited, but certainly interested in seeing what Al Gore has to say about the world today, especially with a climate change denier like President Trump in the White House. Other movies that are coming out this weekend, August 4th, include the long-awaited big-screen adaptation of The Dark Tower, and it's about the last gunslinger, Roland Deschain, who has been locked in an eternal battle with Walter O'Dim, also known as the Man in Black, determined to prevent him from toppling the Dark Tower, which holds the universe together. With the fate of the worlds at stake, good and evil will collide in the ultimate battle as only Roland can defend the tower from the Man in Black. So the Dark Tower is based on the series of books written by Stephen King. It's classified as action, adventure, fantasy, horror, sci-fi, and western. Knowing what I know about the Dark Tower, I don't see the horror aspect of in it other than the fact that it was written by Stephen King, who mostly, about 80% of the time, writes horror movies. But this is a movie that looks very intriguing. It stars Matthew McConaughey as Roland DeChain and Idris Elba as Walter O'Dim. And other actors in the movie include Jackie Earl Haley. That is a movie I definitely will see, and I'll let you know what I think on next week's show. I hope you stay tuned. Another movie that's coming out next weekend is one called Detroit, which is the latest from direct director Catherine Bigelow. It's, his, it's her first movie since Zero Dark Thirty, which is still pretty underrated. So amidst the chaos of the Detroit Rebellion, with the city under curfew and as the Michigan National Guard patrolled the streets, three young African-American men were murdered at the Algiers Motel. So this is, a, this is based on a true story. I don't know exactly when it took place, but uh, just based on the brief description I have, but if, if it was fiction, it wouldn't be listed as history. So the movie stars... John Boyega from Star Wars, The Force Awakens, Anthony Mackie, who has one of the who is Nightwing in the Marvel Comics universe, Algie Smith and Jacob Lattimore, the latter two of whom I'm not familiar with. But Detroit is another movie that I will definitely be seeing and I will let you know what I think on next week's show. Another movie that's coming out is a documentary which is called Step. And I don't know if this is coming to the theater near me, even though it doesn't say that it is coming out in wide release. But this movie still looks intriguing. It documents the senior year of a girls' high school step dance team against the backdrop of inner city Baltimore. So that's not very much of a description, but I'm already hooked. And another film that's coming out this coming weekend is probably a film that could be considered a comeback for Halle Berry, which is the movie Kidnap. And the only tagline I'm given here is a mother stops at nothing to recover her kidnapped son, which might be a comeback for Halle Berry, but I don't know. The plot sounds almost identical to Taken and other movies that have come before and after Taken, but... It is good to see Halle Berry back in the movies again in a starring role. And I know that movies like Catwoman have hindered her career a little bit, but I know she deserves better. I've seen her act in much better things than Catwoman. So this might be a movie I'll see this weekend. I don't know, but I'll I'll give it my best shot and I'll let you know what I think for next week's show. But meanwhile, that just about does it for Words on Film, which is, again, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, which you are listening to on Boston Free Radio, watching on Somerville Community Access TV, or watching on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on the Facebook page of Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, saying I'll see you at the movies.